Well, I heard the story of an older lady who got caught shoplifting, and in her day of court, the judge handled it in a really interesting way. He asked the lady who was there, by the way, with her husband as they stood before the judge, said, ma'am, uh, what what did you what did you do? I understood you you stole some food. Why did you do that? She said, Well, I was hungry. And he said, Well, what did you take? And she said, A can of peaches. And here was the interesting side that he took. He said, How many peaches are in a can? She said, I think about six. He said, Well, here's my judgment on you. You're going to spend six days in jail to learn not to take a can of peaches in the future. And then he said these words, Does anyone else have anything to say? And her husband stood up and said, Your Honor, my wife also took a can of peas. <laughs> now, I did a little bit of research, and the typical number of peas in a 15-ounce can is between 380 to 400 peas. So I would hope that that judge would serve justice, right, and not go way beyond in that way. Today, in just a few moments, we're going to talk about the judgment overall, according to Jesus, that Jesus judges all people. And what I can promise you based on what the scripture teaches and what the actions of Jesus that back this up is that Jesus will judge all, but he will judge all righteously. He knows he knows who we are. He knows what we've done. He also knows the grace that's been extended to us and our response to that. And can I remind you that the first century followers of Jesus, like Yoav, are, were, were Jewish, Jewish people, right? And we're grateful for the Jewish people because it was faithful Jewish people, particularly faithful followers of Jesus, Yeshua, Jesus, that brought us the gospel message. So all the first followers of Jesus were all Jewish, right? And the first followers of Jesus, as they write about Jesus, I want to remind you of what John the Apostle writes, who was one of the guys who was closest to Jesus, I believe. He's the man who leaned against Jesus' chest during during the Last Supper. And he calls himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. He was so blown away that Jesus loved him. I want you to see, and many of you know this, we've talked about this many times, but look how he opens up his gospel about Jesus. He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. As you know, in verse 14, we have clarity on who the Word is. Because he says, and the Word put on flesh and lived among us. And then he begins to explain that Jesus is the one referred to as the Word, and He is Jesus, God the Son, or the Son of God. Look what he says here, though. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. That word in Greek is a word that means that they are face-to-face. It's intimate relationship is this picture. And then it says, and the Word was God. Now, this is really incredible. It's intriguing, and it might throw a curveball to you because you're like, wait a second, I thought He was with God. How could He be God? Well, the New Testament teaches, Jesus teaches, the disciples, the Jewish disciples of Jesus taught, that there is one God. We're monotheists, but there are three distinct persons to who he is. This is why Jesus said, go into all nations, baptizing them in the name of, help me, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Many, many, many places that this claim is made. And so Jesus is not the Father. Jesus is not the Spirit. Jesus is God, the Son. And there is one God with three distinct parts, Father, Son, and Spirit. And so here we go. The Word was God. And watch this. And he was with God in the beginning. If you know your Bible, in the beginning is how Genesis starts off. And the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the, of the Hebrew Scriptures, actually use the same two terms, in NRK, meaning in the beginning, at the, uh, at the author, at the beginning of all things. And so in John, he starts in NRK. And I'm convinced that a Jewish follower of Jesus, if they were familiar with the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Scriptures, they would immediately said, I've heard this before. Yes, you have. It's in Genesis 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God. And the Word was God, and He was with God in the beginning. Watch this. And through Him, what was made? Who is Him in the text, y'all? Jesus, the Word. Through Him, all things were made, and nothing was made that has been made without Him. And so here's the picture. Watch this. All the plants that we see, everything on the earth that we see, the stars and the constellations that we see, and every person we see created by the Lord Jesus. This is what the New Testament teaches. This is what the followers of Jesus taught about him. And so in light of that, suddenly this makes things incredibly intriguing as we recognize that the Son of Man who is coming in judgment can come in judgment. Jesus can come in judgment over all people because he created who? All people. And so as we go through the text, let me remind you where we were last week. Last week we talked about a parable that Jesus talked about where there were 10 virgins. 
where five of the virgins were more prepared than the other five virgins. They had extra oil for the lamps, right? They're awaiting the groom to make his way towards the house of the bride where they would have the wedding. Then they go back to the groom's place for the banquet. And when, when all this occurred, right, the, the, it's interesting because the groom doesn't show up in the time that they're expecting him to, which I think is very interesting. I think Jesus purposely tells this part of the story to give some insight to his first followers, the first followers of Jesus, that his second coming, his ultimate physical return is not going to happen for a long, 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 long time. The first coming in judgment against Jerusalem happens in AD 70 as he comes in judgment to use apocalyptic language, end times kind of language. And then the second coming was not going to happen for a long, 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 long time. Then you also remember that Jesus pointed that story. He says, keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour, right? So as followers of Jesus, we're to be aware, we're to keep watch, we're to be ready for the return of Jesus. The second story you remember was second parable that Jesus talks about a master who gave money to three of his servants and expected them to grow what they had been given. And two of them did, but one did not. And if you remember, he dug a hole and just set the things that, that had been given. When the master came back, verse 21 says, his master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. Anybody heard that before? Many times you would hear that at a funeral, right? This is where it comes from. It's from the words of Jesus and this story that he gives. He says, you have been faithful with a few things and I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. In other words, they enter into the kingdom. They're a part of the kingdom. However, that's not all good news. Here's the rest of the news we talked about last week. And the master replied to the other one, verse 26, you wicked, lazy servant. He has more to say, but he basically says, I gave you this and you dug a hole and you didn't do anything with it. And then verse 30 says, throw the worthless servant outside into the darkness where there would be the weeping and gnashing of teeth. I showed you multiple passages in Matthew last week that that language is used of Jesus in the gospel of Matthew to refer to a place of eternal punishment, Hades, or we would refer to as hell. And it's in that context now that we're going to finish up Matthew 25 and Matthew 24 that remember Jesus was on the Mount of Olives with his disciples. You know, I've been there many times. I've been there twice. Some of you have been there. And we've been to a place that looks similar to this. The only thing that's major different is that big building that's standing there. The temple is no longer there. As Jesus prophesied, not one stone will be left on another. Instead, now you see the Dome of the Rock, which is a sacred site for Muslims. Now watch this, verse 31. And when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. And watch this. All the nations will be gathered before him. Remember that Matthew 24, the focus is judgment against Jerusalem. It's judgment against those who do not trust Jesus as their Messiah. That's the judgment that comes in AD 70. And that's the warning. However, the language shifts in Matthew 24 into Matthew 25. Now, it's not Jerusalem that's being judged. It's all what? All nations. And so it would be Jewish people and all kinds of Gentile people, all kinds of ethnicities. It would include us. It's all people that will be gathered before him. This is the claim. By the way, is this the claim just of Christians like Jackie? According to the first century followers of Jesus, who said this? Jesus said this, right? So he's either crazy or it's true. And those are our two options, right? Look what he says here, verse 32, chapter 25. And he will separate the people from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. There are times that sheep and goats are allowed to roam and allowed to graze together. But typically at night, you would separate those out if you're the shepherd. You would separate the sheep from the goats. And this is the illustration that he's using that people in that day would have known of well. And here's the picture that the Son of Man will do the same thing with people. And so now we get this imagery of the sheep are those who represent those who belong to Jesus, the good shepherd. And the goats are those who do not. By the way, this is interesting because goats, is not nece they're not necessarily bad in the Old Testament. Matter of fact, goats are used in Yom Kippur, right, in the sacrifice. So they're not an unclean animal. It's just in the imagery that Jesus is using. He separates the sheep from the goats. Now, remember the language here. When who comes in his glory? What's the first part say? Who? The Son of Man. We've heard this language before. Remember, this is used of Ezekiel to refer to Ezekiel as a prophet. Oh, Son of Man, the language would be used. And, and what it means is, oh, a Son of Man means a human being. However, when Jesus uses the term Son of Man, he's not just referring to himself as a human being. As a matter of fact, when Jesus stands before the Sanhedrin, the religious supreme court of the day. And they say, are you the son of God? Are you, are you the Messiah? And Jesus says, yes, and you will see the son of man coming in glory. You remember that? 
This is the passage it comes from. You remember this, and I wanted you to see this. Daniel, written roughly 600 years before the time, the ministry of Jesus. Here's what he says. Daniel 7, 13. In my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like a, help me, son of man. What's he mean? He says, in my vision, I saw somebody who looked human in this, in this vision. And he was coming with the clouds of heaven. But this is interesting. Listen how it ties in. He approached the ancient of days and was led into his presence. Who's the ancient of days? Really simply, this is God, right? So you have someone who looks human, who approaches God, the ancient of days. Look at what it says. And he was given authority and glory and sovereign power. Watch this. All, help me, all nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. The Hebrew term that's used is a term meaning to, to bow down before. All people worshipped him. And his dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And watch this. His, help me, what's that K word? His kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Watch this. If this is his kingdom, then that means he is the king. Now this makes total sense in light of what Jesus is about to say further in this message we're looking at from Matthew 25. Look at this. He, the son of man, watch this, will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And then who will say? Then the king will say. So watch this. The son of man is also the one who claims to be the king. And the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. Hmm. Parents many times leave an inheritance to their children. This is the idea. And the idea here, the inheritance for those who are his sheep, is that they're, they're going to be allowed to be part of and in coming into the kingdom. That's the idea. This is the inheritance. It's the inheritance for followers of Jesus. The goats refer to those who are not genuine followers of Jesus. Now, look what it goes on to say, verse 35, for I was hungry and you did what? You gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Now, let me ask you a question. Does Jesus teach that it's by good works that we come into the kingdom? Is that what he teaches? No. Matter of fact, the Bible is very clear that Jesus died on a cross to pay for our what? Sin. And so we ask this question all the time. If you could be good enough, why in the world did Jesus have to die? Correct? The claim of Jesus is that he and his disciples, that he died on the cross to actually pay for the sins of anyone who would put their trust in him and turn from their sin. So to be clear, as we read this, we go, oh, well, so that's how we get into heaven. We, we, we provide for the strangers and give clothes. No, no, no. That's not what the gospel of Matthew is about. It's not what the message of Jesus or his disciples are about. But here's what it is. Watch this. It's a demonstration of who they belong to in the way that they live and the actions that they carry out. Look what the scripture says. This is really interesting. And the righteous will say, will answer him, Lord, by the way, righteous, if you take big words like that and break them down to smaller words, here's what it means. Those who are right with God, that's what it means. And again, remember, as followers of Jesus, we're not made right with God by our good works. Right? We're not made right with God via our good work. We're made right with God because of the payment that was made for us. And listen to what he says. The righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you, a stranger, invite you in? And they're needing clothes and clothe you. When did we see you sick or in prison and go and visit you? And it's interesting that followers of Jesus are saying, Lord, we're not aware of that. We don't ever remember seeing you, clothing you, feeding you. Here's the picture. And this is what I appreciate is there's this humility, right? There's not this aspect of, yeah, Jesus, everything we did, we did for you. You know, and there's not that. It's almost like they did the right thing and they did it with the right intention, and they're not receiving any praise, and they're trying to figure out what do you mean by this. Look what he says. But truly I tell you, whatever you did for the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Huh. So what Jesus says, this is very interesting. He says this. The first part I want you to get in context that makes a lot of sense. The language that Jesus uses is whatever you did for who? These who? Yeah, the least, but in particular, the, these here, brothers and sisters of mine and Christians, I think sometimes we miss out on the context and we miss a whole lot because the first group Jesus is talking about, he's saying those who respond 
to my followers and treat my followers with, with kindness and, and treat them with, with honor and provide for them. That's who he's talking about. Brothers and sisters used in the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus never uses that of people who are not followers of his. Matter of fact, let me give you a quick example of what I mean by that. Do you remember when Jesus was told, hey, Jesus, your mother and your brothers are here. Do you remember that? Look how Jesus responded in Matthew 12, 48. And he replied, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And pointing to his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. And whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my help me, my brother and my sister. See, maybe you've never even thought about this because I think in our culture, we immediately go, well, we've got to help the homeless and we've got to help the people who don't have food. And we've got, and, and we're going to get to that because we should. But listen to me, if you're a follower of Jesus, the first responsibility you have is to other followers of Jesus, brothers and sisters, to care for them, to meet their needs. And you know what I love about our church? I love that our church has done a ton to meet the needs of our community, people who aren't followers of Jesus. But I also love that our church has done a ton to care for those who are part of the family of God, who are part of the faith family of the Lord Jesus, to care for them. Man, if I could thank you one more time, I will, for the, the way you've ex- helped Tanya and me in, in the cancer stuff that we went through six years ago. Thank you so much. I thank you for the way you care for other people. There's somebody who's new to our church and recently she said, hey, I need a, I need a bed for my granddaughter to come and stay in. I, I'm, willing to, I'm willing to pay for it, whatever. And I put it out online and two or three of you said, hey, I've got a bed. We'll give it to you. That's cool. That is really, really cool. And can I remind you in light of the context that followers of Jesus in first century Israel, the Jewish followers of Jesus, some of them got tremendously persecuted by other people who did not believe Jesus was the Messiah. Remember, Jesus was killed for, what's that B word we've talked about? Blasphemy. Blasphemy is either speaking evil against God or claiming to be God. And claiming to be God is what Jesus did. The the Jews said this clearly in John 10. We don't kill you for any good works, but because you, a mere man, claim to be God. He's killed for blasphemy. And so here's the picture, that if if you're a, a Jewish person who doesn't believe Jesus is the Messiah, and you believe that Jesus is actually blasphemous, it would make sense if you've hired somebody who is also Jewish, but believe Jesus is the Messiah, that he is God the Son, that you would see what they're doing is blasphemous, and you could fire them. Well, guess what? If you get fired, you can't find another job. What are you going to be? Hungry. You're going to be thirsty. You're going to need some clothing. You're going to need a place to stay. And this is the picture in the context of what's going on. But beyond all that, let me, let me show you what Paul writes later. He says, and let us not grow weary in doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have the opportunity, watch this. Let us do good to who? Everybody. Everyone. Now, who's everyone include? Everybody, right? That's believers, non-believers, whoever. Now, watch this. But watch this. Especially to those who are of the household of faith. What's Paul mean by that? He would say followers of Jesus ought to take care of followers of Jesus. You know, when my family goes through something difficult financially, my first responsibility is to them. If your family's going through something difficult financially, and my family's going through something difficult financially, and I can't provide for both, who's going to get provided for first? My family. That makes sense. I'm responsible for my family. So too with you, right? And, and so this is the picture for the family of God first. And then of, of what God gives beyond that, we can help to serve other people. And let me remind you, we are called from the Old Testament to the New Testament to love your, what's the N, N word we use? Love your neighbor like you love yourself. That doesn't mean the person who lives right next to you. Jesus answered the question, who's my neighbor? And he gave the story of the good Samaritan, right? And Jewish people at the time would not have thought any Samaritans were good. And he makes him the hero of the story. But here's the point of that. The good Samaritan cared for He cared for somebody he never met because he had a need that he could meet. And so in Jesus' story, the neighbor is somebody you just met who has a need that you can meet. So we're called to love certainly our family, right? Certainly our friends, certainly our neighbors, but even our enemies. Look at what Paul writes here in Romans 12, one of the greatest chapters in all the New Testament Scripture. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. You know how this works? You're driving down the interstate and somebody runs 90 past you and cuts you off. I know you want to bless them, don't you? You're like, yeah, I'm blessing them out. No, I don't mean that, right? And here's how I pray. Lord, help the cops bless, or, well, help the cops bless them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Lord, help the cops catch them so they don't hurt anybody. But Lord, help, help me not to use Greek terms like idiot, right? I said, Man, that's an idiot. You know, Lord, help that person. Help them in that way. Bless and do not. 
curse. Do not repay evil for evil. Later he says, if possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Get this. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for, help me, God's wrath. Do you think God can judge? Do you think he can judge righteously? Absolutely. And he says, and he quotes Old Testament scriptures, we call Old Testament scriptures, Hebrew scriptures, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. Watch this. On the contrary, now Paul quotes from Proverbs, wisdom writings. He says, if your enemy is hungry, look at this. What do you do? Feed him. Does this apply with the context of what Jesus says, right? I mean, my followers, if somebody's hungry, what do you do? If, you have, if they have a need you can meet, you feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you heap burning coals on his head, which basically means he will be ashamed when you're that one serving him and he's treated you so harshly. He says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. In other words, watch this. That the king recognizes simple acts of those who treat others with kindness and value. I mean, think about it. Did Jesus say, did he say this? Hey, somebody was sick and you went and in a prayer of faith, you healed them miraculously. Do you remember that being in the story? No, here's what he said. They were sick and you went and you took care of them. You visited them. Can we do that? Yeah. Do you have to have a miraculous gift of preaching and proclaiming the, the message of Jesus? Do you have to have that, watch this, to feed somebody who's hungry? To, to give drink to somebody who's thirsty? No. How about this? Do you, do you have to have overwhel overwhelming charisma to, to actually take time to go into a prison to care for a prisoner? You know what I love about our church? I love that so many of you over the last few years, there have been so many more who put their hands to the plow. We've become much more blue collar in our mentality. Many of us are serving. We're willing to get out there and sweat at a food pantry and help people with food. Yoab was asking me, what are those buildings over there? I said, man, this is this stuff where we're helping people like legit, like hundreds of families that we're helping. And watch this, here's the kicker. We're not just trying to feed them food. We're trying to fill their belly, and then we're trying to tell them why. Because they're valuable, made in the image of God, and we want to talk with them about Jesus. Do you know there's some people in the room that are here that have been served in the food pantry? Did you know that? Isn't that cool? Do you know there are some people in the room that have been impacted by Celebrate Recovery as people have a heartbeat to, for that, to care for the least of these, for those who have been down and out and struggling? There are some people in the room because some people have invested and taken time to do that. Isn't that wonderful? Did you know there are some, there are some guys currently in the room that, that have gone into the prison on multiple occasions who walked through razor wire and gone into a place that many would say, I ain't going there, and we go in to care for, for prisoners and to share the message of Jesus with them? Did you know that? Isn't that cool? On and on and on we could go because many of you, you've cared for children. You've invested in children. Some people write children off and go, they're not that important. Jesus thinks differently, doesn't he? You talk about the least of these. You talk about those who are, who are not super strong and the ones you would think of immediately as being the most impact. You have done that. And I'm grateful for that. Here's our big truth. Here it is. Here, here's what Jesus is getting at. That how we serve shows who we serve. That how we serve, it shows who we serve. Now, you can check the box and we can say, well, I did this and I did this and I did this. Pat ourselves on the back. If that's the goal, you're not really sharing who Jesus is, are you? But you know, when people say, hey, thank you for helping me in this area, we can say, man, it's, it's my privilege. It's an honor to serve you. And, I'm, and you want to know why I'm serving you? I'm serving you because Jesus has been so gracious to me and he is a servant. Can I tell you more about him? Isn't that wonderful? Hey, shouldn't, shouldn't our culture know, watch this, shouldn't our culture know, first of all, Jesus says, they will know that you are my disciples by the love you have for one another. If we're meeting each other's needs, shouldn't, wouldn't the culture go, man, you guys care for each other in a different way than we do, right? How about this? If we're meeting the needs of people in our culture and they ask this question, why are you doing that? I'm glad you asked. I'm glad you asked because you matter to the one true God. And here's the kicker, watch this. Did Jesus treat people with value? Absolutely. He cared about people other people didn't care about, right? He touched the lepers. He touched the woman with, or allowed the woman to touch him who had the, the blood disease, right? I mean, he cared about people nobody else cared about. He took the children when the disciples were going, he didn't have time for you. And he took them in their, his arms and he blessed them, right? And says, of such is the kingdom of God, right? Does Jesus value people? Yeah. So if we're followers of Jesus, what, would, what should we do? Value people. Did Jesus serve people? Uh, yeah like a lot. 
If Jesus served people and we're followers of Jesus, then what? We should serve people too. So don't get this out of order. We don't come into the kingdom because of good works, but watch this. If we're a part of the kingdom, good works ought to be a part of our life. Is he, if He's forgiven us much, we ought to live like we've been forgiven what? Much. If, if, if we are grateful for what He's given us, we ought to show that gratefulness by the way we care for other people. I appreciate what John MacArthur said. He said this. He said, Scripture is very clear in teaching that the evidence for assurance of true salvation is not found in a past moment of decision, but a continuous pattern of righteous behavior. Again, that doesn't mean we do enough good things, we're right with God. No. We can do enough good things. Jesus didn't have to die on the cross. But listen to me. When, when the spiritual DNA of Jesus is living in our life because we've trusted Him, He comes in by the power of His Spirit, then we ought to want to do the things that Jesus did to care for people. However, that judgment stuff we talked about, hey, welcome in, right? You're a part of the kingdom. Well done, all that. It's good. Until we come to this part of the text. Look at verse 41. And then He will say to those on His left, this is the goats in the story, Depart from me, you who are, help me, what? Cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. We've said many times, we live in a culture that doesn't like that version of Jesus, right? And so what we do is we hear people say, well, Jesus never judged. And I've got one simple question. What text are you reading? What text? Are, Jesus, Jesus judged righteously. And one day he's going to judge all people for all of time. And people go, well, that's not my version of Jesus. And I would say, then you have the wrong version of Jesus. No one is more compassionate and gracious than him. We've already touched on this. He cared for people nobody else cared about, right? However, he also judges with righteousness. We use this term here. This is not build a bear Jesus. You don't get to make Jesus into your version. I like the sweet, cuddly version of Jesus, you know, and instead of the one that judges. No, the, the compassionate, caring, kind, loving version of Jesus is also the one who judges with righteousness. He is the king, and he is the judge. And watch this. This king and this judge doesn't just judge you. This king and this judge put on skin and then went to a cross in a real place called Jerusalem that we've been to. And he got nailed on a real Roman cross. And he was abused and spit on and beaten to a bloody pulp before that ever happened. And Jesus did that. The judge and the king did that to make payment for your sin and my sin. What kind of king is this? What kind of judge is this that would take off the judge's robe and say, I'll carry your sentence for you? Incredible. Incredible. Now look at what Jesus goes on to say, verse 42. We're almost done. He says, for I was hungry, and you gave me what? Nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, you did not clothe me. I was a sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. And they will also answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? You can, go, you can almost hear them saying, Lord, if we, knew, if we knew it was you, man, that's different. Are there some people that you would care for because they're better looking? Are there some people that you would care for because they're more astute or intellectually esteemed? Are there some people that you would care for because they have a higher view by the people in our culture have a higher view of them? What about the people that everybody doesn't look up to? And Jesus says in this, here's what he goes on to say. They will answer, Lord, when do, when do we see you? In all these ways. And then Jesus will say, Truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. I've been very convicted in my own life at times. Because there have been times that I would care for somebody who is smart, kind, and gentle, well thought of. But then we run on, up on those who are not so much that, but they have a genuine need. And the Lord Jesus says, you know what? How we serve shows who we serve. Not only do we serve those who are our friends and our family and our neighbors, but we would even serve our enemies. That's what it means to love your enemies, by the way. It doesn't mean go up and give them a kiss and spend all day with them. It's not what it means. To love someone means you have their best interest in mind. That's what it means. And so we would act 
even to our enemies, like we have their best interests in mind. Our enemies on the side of the street because their tire's blown out, we're like, bless God, thank you for doing it. No. We go up and say, can I help you change your tire? And our enemies might go, why would you do that? And we say, I'm glad you, glad you asked. And so the ultimate day is coming, y'all, when Jesus is going to judge all according to his claims, according to the claims of his disciples. And here's the kicker. Watch this. Everybody in the room, starting with me, everybody watching online or who hears this later, every person, according to Jesus, is going to be judged. And there's one of two options. He's either going to say, welcome. Welcome into the kingdom. Or he's going to say, depart from me. I do not know you. And the issue is going to be whether we've turned from our sin and turned to the Lord Jesus or not. And let me just remind you, if you're the person that says, but Jackie, my good has outweighed my bad. Really? Let me just ask you a few questions. We've done this before. How many lies have you told in your life? If, if you said none, I would call you a liar, liar, pants on fire. That's what I'd say. I say, how many times have you lusted after somebody who's not your spouse? Many of us would go, wow. Mm. How many times have you gossiped or slandered about somebody? You've purposely spoken evil against them to harm them, not to bless them. Mm. Anybody here ever stole anything? How many times have, have wicked words come out of our mouth? Has abusive, foul, awful, nasty language that if Jesus were there, or your mama was there, you wouldn't be saying. How many times have you participated in drunkenness or some sort of drug to, to, to totally abuse your body? We could go on and on, couldn't we? Hey, look at me. Every person here started with me. We are major guilty, are we not? And so we don't come to them and say, here's what I got to bring to you. You're worthy of me. No, no, no. We come to Him and we can, we can cry out like we sing before Jesus paid it all. All to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Look at the last passage here. And they will go away to what kind of punishment, y'all? Eternal. eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. People go, see, Jackie, I don't believe in eternal hell because God wouldn't send somebody to hell for eternity. Really? Where are you getting that from? I can tell you where you're getting it from. It's build a bear Jesus. Jesus of the Scripture talks about eternal life. By the way, that would mean life that is everlasting, correct? If he talks about punishment and uses the same, the same Greek words being used by Matthew to relate to what Jesus is saying, it means the same kind of eternity. Does that make sense? There are some people who believe in annihilationism. In other words, that God just annihilates those poof, you're gone, and it's over. That's not what Jesus taught. It's not what his disciples taught. And what that ought to do for you and me is it ought to cause pause in our life, right? It ought to cause a moment that we hit the brakes and we go, wait a second, like eternity is real. I believe in eternal life. Everybody wants to go to heaven. Everybody thinks, you know, somebody dies and becomes an angel, goes to heaven, which is bad theology. Doesn't happen that way, right? Worst person on the planet. Well, he's in a better place now. Are you sure? Not according to Jesus. This ought to cause us to pause and go, you know what? Do I know that I know him? Where is my hope? Here's what I'm telling you today. I'm telling you, if I die today, my hope is not in Jackie. My hope is not in my good works outweighing my bad works. My hope is not in how much Bible I might know. My hope is not in how many people I've helped. And you could say the same thing about all of you, I hope. My hope is in the Lord Jesus alone and what he's done for me. My hope is the payment he made for me. And so if I boast, I boast, as Paul says, as in boasting for the Lord Jesus. And so I pray that you would look at your life and, and examine your own life and say, does my life show who I serve? You know what some people do? They serve good things that become God things and it's no longer a good thing. I know people that are more concerned about what their family thinks than what Jesus thinks. They're more concerned with, with making sure that their kids are pleased than they're making sure that Jesus is pleased. Good things can become God things and they're no longer good in that order. Isn't that true? And so I don't know this, where this leaves you, but here's what I know. Here's what, here's what I hope that you walk away with. Watch this. There's a day coming that judgment will occur. That the Lord Jesus, who is the Son of Man of Daniel 7, 
who is the Word, who put on skin, who is God the Son, who put on flesh, is going to judge all people of all nations. And we will all stand before Him, accountable to Him. Where does that leave you? I know for many of you, you would say, Jackie, my whole hope is in Jesus. I don't bring my accolades and my trophies to Him. I bring every, every, everything and I say, Lord, I need you more than I need that. That's where your hope is. Good. But if not, if you want to talk further about this, it would be our great privilege. Our staff, this is why we put our numbers in your notes every week. It's why we put our numbers on the screen. Call us. We'd love to sit down and talk with you. I've told you this before. We won't shove Jesus down your throat, right? If we could do that, my arm would already be down to your esophagus, but that's not how it works. We'll sit with you and we'll share why we believe Jesus is worthy of your life. Our deacons and wives, they'd love to serve you. They'd love to help you. And people in the room, other believers would love to help you. If you're online, you're going, Jackie, I don't know any of you people. Then talk with somebody in your community who actually seems to follow Jesus of the Scripture and ask them why. Ask them to share their beliefs and their evidences for Jesus of Nazareth who rose from the dead. That would be our great privilege. We're going to finish today. Here's what we're going to do. It's going to be um, a, a neat way to finish. I have the privilege, along with several other guys who were able to do this, I have the privilege of going into the prison every week. So on Wednesday mornings, I go to the prison for two hours, and thankfully they typically let me out, so that's nice. <laughs> there are 50 guys that I get to minister to in that prison that many times, many of them end up ministering to me. Many of them in prison, they became followers of Jesus. And they said, man, I am thankful that God allowed me to come to prison. If it weren't for this, I'd be dead. I would have killed somebody else further. This past week, I did something I've never done with them, and I want to do this with you today. Finish. I said, you know, some of you guys, you have different needs, and it's easy. I said, I can imagine being in here, it's easy to bow up, bow your chest up, and say, I don't need anybody. I don't, but many of these guys in this group are followers of Jesus. Some of them are accountable in relationships to each other and such. And so I want to encourage you today to meet with two or three, just two or three people, two or three guys, and we're going to close today. And I want you to share in 30 seconds or less one prayer need that you have, and then one of your brothers pray for you. I wish you could have heard in the next 15 minutes of what happened to me. As men, guys in blue, but men, looked at each other and shared stuff in their life. The group that I was in, one of them, here's what he shared. He shared, he said, I haven't sensed the Lord's presence very strongly for quite some time, and I don't know why. Would you pray for me? I said, no, i got better things to do. Of course I'll pray for you. Right? And I prayed for him. You know what the other guy said? He said, my brother, his son this past week just committed suicide. This guy with tears in his eyes is hurting for his brother. What do we do? We, we pray for him. They asked what they, they could pray for me about. And I told them, and guess what? Those guys prayed for me. Listen to me. If we're followers of Jesus, one of the ways that we can demonstrate love towards other believers is asking how they're doing and then us being honest enough to share how we're really doing and then say, how can I care for you? What need can I meet in your life? And so what I want you to do, not just with family members. Now, if you've got family members here, I want you to get with a couple other people as well and just ask this question. It ought to be 30 seconds or less, the response, how can I pray for you? And the response, 30 seconds or less. And then if you're comfortable, would you pray for them and have them do the same? And that's how we'll close, okay? Let me pray for you and we'll do that. Lord, thank you for the privilege of allowing us to meet together. Thank you for the precious people in this room. I pray that you would have your way in each life. Thank you for Yoav and his family. We pray that you would protect them, guide them, bless them. We ask that in your mighty name. Amen.